And we are, as a people, inherently and historically Wake up. opposed to the secret societies, the Se secret oaths, and the secret proceedings. The show that asks questions about why we don't ask questions. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Welcome to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. I'm Alan Park. These are conspiracy queries, and there are going to be some fascinating questions today because, uh, well, I'm dealing with a politician as my guest today. Number one, so you're already in trouble right there. As soon as you start to claim that you're going to get a politician to tell you the truth, it's not easy. And there's usually a record later of how they weren't telling the truth now. Hopefully Simon Parks from Whitby in England is going to level with us. And he is a fascinating individual. You'll find that uh, Simon claims much contact throughout his entire life with, uh, I have to be careful here, not aliens, but interdimensional beings which might include aliens. You'll have to listen to the show to find out. But the uh, fascinating thing about Simon is he's a, a counselor in England, and that is what he does from day to day. And uh, despite what many people would claim are ludicrous claims, and his constituents vote for him, and uh, he's a very level-headed, clear and concise individual. And I really look forward to hearing what you think about my discussion with Simon Parks, who's coming up next. Interesting to be talking to Simon Parks, who is on the line with us on Skype all the way from Great Britain. How are you, Simon? I'm very well, Alan. Thanks ever so much for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. We are so looking forward to uh, uh, listening to some things you have to tell us. First of all, let's, let's get to know you. You, uh, you have a day job. Tell us about what that is. Yeah, um, I teach people to drive motor cars. I think in the Americans it's called a driving teacher, but in England we say it's a driving instructor. Well, that sounds more safe right there. <laughs> so that's what you do in the day job? That's correct, yeah. And are you or were you a politician of some sort? Oh, I still am. Oh, okay. Um, that's, oh. Uh, that's my other day job. Oh, so I'm good. That's right. When I asked you what you do, uh, you, you didn't think about being a politician as work. Well, that's good. Uh, you <laughs> no, seem... I, I see that as politics. <laughs> okay, good. So you're more honest than I thought. All right. So you're also Thank a you. politician. And in what capacity are, do, are you a politician? I'm a, an elected uh, Labour. There's a Labour Party, an elected Labour Party councillor for the town that I live in. Okay. And that's in England somewhere. Uh, uh, it's in Whitby. Whitby, okay. And so is you it... should know that because we are actually uh, in Whitby in, uh, in in England. We are uh, twinned with, uh, I think it's Ontario. So oh, oh, we yeah. are actually twinned with a Canadian city. Ten minutes down the road from where I live. Or there I probably, you go. Probably shouldn't have we said also, that. We often, we often have delegations that come over and we did a flag exchange last year. Um, and so, yeah, we, we're very close to you guys. Which, which flag did you exchange? Uh, we gave the Union flag, and uh, you gave us the, the lovely Maple Leaf flag. Was that a fair trade, do you think? Um, well, it depends if you're French-speaking or English-speaking, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I guess we know what station we're listening to right now. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, okay, so you're a, an elected politician. Now, uh, what, found, what I found interesting about you uh, coming across your uh, name and doing a little research is you are uh, what, uh, I guess, a contactee would be the best way to describe you or the easiest one word I could think of. You, you've been contacted and have uh, things to do with and, and deep knowledge of. Uh, are they aliens? Are they interdimensional beings? What are you talking about here? I prefer the word experiencer. Um, okay. I think if you were to look at somebody like Alex Collier, I would say he was your archetypal contactee. Uh, I'm certainly not an abductee because I can remember making an agreement with this group of aliens back in 1971 when I was just short of my 12th birthday. So I never considered it abduction. Uh, contactee is, my understanding, is when somebody comes and collects you and they take you away and you have a nice little chat. 
Um, I, I fall in between the two, so I refer to that as experiencer. Your second question, um, some of them are ET, extraterrestrial. In other words, they are uh, living-bodied creatures that travel here, maybe takes them 20, 30 years to get here. But most of the creatures that I uh, experience are from the fourth dimension. So uh, the correct term would be extra-dimensional entities. And these are beings that you first encountered when you were 12 years old? No. Nope. Um, the, 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 the actual experience in 1971, which I just referred to, was when I made an agreement with them. Um, but my youngest, my earliest experience would be as a very small child. Wow. And, and so this is shaped and, and colored and been part of your entire life? Yes, it has. Was it frightening as a, a four-year-old kid? No, because um, generally you know no different. Um, the only thing that was, was scary for me was a particular being that researchers refer to as a shadow being or a shadow person. Oh, that was my French um, teacher. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> That was the only one that frightened me. Um, but as I have never been hurt by these creatures, I have no reason to fear them. Wow. And, and so frightened because it was the first time seeing something like this, but you're so young, it was, it was okay for you. Yeah, the first time that I saw a shadow creature, that did scare me. Did yes. you get to a point in your life as a youngster, per perhaps even before double digits at six, seven, eight, nine years old, or maybe into your early uh, double digits or even teens, where you started to compare your intake and mental notes with your friends who, I'm guessing... Uh, have not had the extensive um, contact, sorry, <laughs> that uh, you have? Uh, it, it started a lot earlier than that. Um, the, the main creature that would come to collect me uh, referred to itself as my mother. Uh, so I called it mother. Now, when I first learned to talk, I guess I must have been about a year and a half or two years old, mm -hmm. I was very confused because my biological mother... Um, said that, you know, she's my mother, yet this other creature said it's my mother. Um, and so I'm told by the family that for six months I didn't call my biological mother mother because how could she be my mother because this other creature was my mother. And the very, very first word I ever said uh, was daddy. And I call my mother, my human mother, daddy, for six months and then I realized that you know you can't do this it's too confusing it's too upsetting and you have to learn to play the human game so I learned well before ages of six or seven what was appropriate and what wasn't to say in ordinary company okay how does this uh, knowledge this life that you have that I'm pretty sure I can say most of us don't have this experience or these experiences over the course of our lifetimes I know I didn't don't how, how does that affect you in your uh, job and let's let's kind of swing it over to politics more at, at when we're talking about your jobs and even you know your other job too how does that affect you and dealing with other people um, in terms of my job no it doesn't affect me at all because I've learned over 54 years to live in two worlds basically so when I'm doing my politics, then I'm relating to the political situations to those that have elected me. If I'm doing my paid job in terms of your normal nine to five work, um, I deal with that. Uh, it's, it's about other people's perceptions and other people's way of dealing with me. Now, somebody who knows me it just, just talks to me normally, but say the media or someone who hasn't met me, they have this perception, this idea of who or what I might be like and when they actually come to meet me they're completely shocked because the stereotypical image that mainstream media pump out uh, just doesn't wash with me it doesn't doesn't work so it, it's quite it's quite difficult for many people who expect to see a, a very um, odd person when they find a member of the establishment talking to them right I understand that there's a, a, a media manipulation if you will. I mean, that's why this show started. I got tired of, you know, not having the right questions being asked. And I don't always ask the right questions, but I'm trying to, you know, I'm not obscuring sure. knowledge. And I just feel like things have been painted over uh, consistently over the years. Let's let's say that um, 
a little research of, of mine into your uh, your uh, life and what you're doing is uh, the the word Illuminati comes up and we're on conspiracy queries with Alan Park. So we've touched on this subject many times. Uh, you have a detailed knowledge of it. And I'm wondering, is that connected to your uh, experiences with uh, interdimensional beings, etc., and shadow beings and, and these other entities? Or is it uh, a separate issue? No, you're correct. <clears throat> um, the reptilian group and um, what we would prefer to call the jinn, although the Dead Sea Scrolls would refer to as the velon, uh, are very, very connected with the dark masters, the dark black magis magicians of the Illuminati. Uh, I grew up in, in an Illuminati family, not one of the key bloodlines like uh, the Rockefeller or the Rothschild, but nevertheless, one of the lower issue um, groups within the Illuminati. It was a magical, non-satanic, magical family. So my knowledge is gained not from research, but from personal experience. And when you say magical, uh, just help me out with that a little bit. Spread, spread out that definition a little more for us. Well, even though we have the Internet, most people don't really understand how the Illuminati work or how they're structured. Or if they're um, even there. Right. So you have um, different... When you are a family, a bloodline family, um, you, you are put into a group. So if you are going to come from a military background, you would join the Knights Templar group or one of the Knights groups. If you are destined for a satanic group, then you will join one of the, the satanic group. But there are magical... There are two magical groups that I'm aware of within the Illuminati that are not directly practicing uh, Satanism. And so my family has come from a magical line within the Illuminati. Wow. And and what did they do? What your immediate your parents, your, your father and your mother, what were they doing? Uh, well, my, my father disappeared when I was about three months old. Um, so I, I never met my father. And uh, my biological mother never re remarried. She brought me up on her own. Um, my biological mother worked for the British Security Services, which uh, are known as MI5, and my grandfather, that's her dad, worked for uh, the, the British Securities, the British Security Services, which are called MI6, so he, it was a very, very, not a military family, but it was a, an espionage, uh, security-based type of family. Hmm. Wow. Uh, and then you uh, gradually uh, maintained awareness and interests in that uh, Illuminati side of things as you um, well, e grew. E yeah, well, when you are a child in an Illuminati family, you are, um, you are brought up in a certain way, uh, depending on what the, uh, um, the outcome. Families will decide what their children are going to be or, or, or how they will be structured. But because of the very, very heavy uh, alien connection that I had, uh, it was very clear that most of the directing was coming from the alien side, not the human side. So I didn't end up as a banker or as a lawyer. Um, it wasn't the Illuminati that most people understand. There is a whole range of families who come under the Illuminati banner that are not to the, the archetypal pattern that most people think. So the family that I came from was a uh, British security family, intelligence network family, um, and I was the only child, you know, from my mother. Hmm. Now, uh, you also talked about um, it, it, something regarding the movement of these uh, beings, uh, the aliens. You said that uh, moving through time is not a speed issue. It's more of a portal issue. Yes. Uh, is that still the case? Are the portals permanent? Are they in flux? Are they always there? Are we in danger of, of having too many or, or losing some that we need portals? Well, portals are fixed generally. Um, so they'll remain uh, on the earth or just above the earth. There are some portals which um, collapse. But generally, uh, if a portal is here, and working, it's been there for many millions of years. So I think you'd find that we don't know where all the portals are, and some will open and close at different times. Who do you figure um, has the best map, per se, 
for those portals? Is that a military piece of knowledge or a, a, no, a it, spiritual? It would, be, it would be it would be an Illuminati knowledge. That's that is um, one of the sacred uh, bits of knowledge that would be maintained by the Illuminati. Mm. And and they travel. So the connecting. I'm going to say if it's a portal, it, it's like some kind of a tube between. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, Alan. Yes. That's all I can think of. So they get to travel back and forth in there. All right, so this is a small percentage, though, these people, these types of people that represent uh, the planet, right? But you figure they're mostly the ones that are in charge of things on a political level? I would say that there are probably in, in the North America, there are probably two million who are affiliated to the Illuminati. So I would say there were two million men, women, and children in and Illuminati families in North America. And a lot of those um, are in Denver, am I guessing that? <laughs> uh, you know, the whole airport thing? You know? um, every state in America is uh, divided into um, quadrants or sections, um, and it's run on a military basis, although it's done as an administrative uh, process. And the best place to hide facilities uh, would be under an airport or a hospital, and you'll find that often that's the case. Hmm. So if if we're milling around in our lives, not paying attention to the directives and, and the, the tasks completed and, and things uh, conjured, I guess, if you're going to use the word magic, from, from a, an entire section of society that most people not only don't know that they're there, but wouldn't believe that they were there if they heard about it, are, are we in any kind of a... And I say we, I mean the folks that aren't in the, those cliques. Are we in any kind of danger? I mean, is is the tightening of uh, political controls and invading countries without uh, asking Congress and, and the breakdown of, of rule of law while they still claim that there is one, is that – are we going into an entropy here? And are these uh, other beings here to help us, watch us and do nothing or uh, or, or intervene somehow? Um. Because I think we're spinning out of control, Simon. I think, you know what I mean? Like, it, we're in such a mess that part of me says, yeah, well, if there's a hyper-intelligent interdimensional being or whoever that can fix Fukushima and other horrible things that we do and perpetuating the constant use of, of chemicals and, and, and poisoning ourselves when we can just as easily grow it out of other plants and, and things like that. Anyway, I'm getting on a limb here, but you know what I'm saying? Like, what, yes, what can we do to show the people that, I guess, don't know or believe that, you know, we're, we're being whipped around, that, that that is the case and that we have the numbers on our side if we can get it together? Well, you put several questions in there. The first, the Sorry. first answer to your question is that uh, is the fact that most Earth humans are totally unaware is exactly the situation that the elite want. Uh, as long as the majority of humanity is unaware of how it's been manipulated, um, then the status quo will remain. Uh, to your second question, um, humanity is the seventh cavalry. It's no good people looking up for a saviour to come and get them. The humans must work together, work as a group, and basically say, no more, we're not going to do this, we're not going to be pushed around. And I, and I say when I do my talks up and down, down the country, look, if you all stopped going to buy gas on a Tuesday, you would have the companies coming to the table to talk to you. But you're not exercising your powers, um, you are just being led by the nose. So I think what, what we're seeing um, is larger numbers of people now becoming awake, questioning, um, not believing the rubbish they've been given. And it's becoming harder and harder and harder for the, for the elite to maintain this facade. So it, actually, it's, it's positive, but we are running out of time. We are running out of time, but that's OK. Uh, we're going to leap into some more of this if, uh, if you can stick around. And we're back with Simon Parks uh, live. Well, he's live anyway. This is pre-recorded, as you guys all know. But anyway, he's in uh, England right now, th staying up late with us as we record this show. Uh, Simon, tell us what it is like uh, from and I mean, you know, you have to remember you're speaking to someone. I've never had I've never had this happen to me. But how is it when you go through the period, whatever it takes place to be collected? Is this mm -hmm. a, a momentary brief thing that someone in the room wouldn't even see or is this like several hours long or how what goes on and how does it feel and, and what takes place um well first of all an entity has to 
um, arrive, and they can either arrive by a craft, um, but every time they arrive by a craft, they are opening themselves up to detection, and not just detection from um, the Earth military, but detection from other factions. You did ask a, a roundabout question before the break, and I didn't really answer it, but we'll perhaps weave that one in. Sure. Um, you, you talked about the aliens, but it's a common misconception to think that all aliens have the same agenda. They don't. Uh, they are just like humans on Earth. You'll have one country with one agenda, one group with another agenda. So when I'm answering and talking about these aliens, I'm obviously talking about the group that I'm familiar with. Um, there are plenty of groups out there that don't, don't come and contact me. So the groups that I would mostly see uh, what the, the Americans refer to as the mantis. In the England, mantis. We call them, yeah, in England we call them mantid. Uh, and a draconian or draconis reptilians. So those are the two main groups that I'm familiar with. Although there's another group um, colloquially called the lion people or the cat people, but their real name is Kilroti. So okay. that's, the, that's the family, that's the name of them. So what will happen is, finally, to finish off your question, is that um, usually a portal will open literally in your room, uh, usually in the same place, and they will step through, literally just step right through from their reality, the fourth dimension, straight into this third dimension world. Um, if there are other people in the room, and there often are, they put them into a freeze uh, frame, so they, they basically go into slow motion. Uh, I might spend five minutes with them, I might spend two hours with them, but they are able to manipulate time. Sometimes I'll, you know, there'll be what people call a missing time, but they have the technology to put you back to the moment they arrived. Um, mm. I've had people in the room with me when this has happened who haven't been able to recall the creature, but felt that what the hell's gone on here? We've, we've been here 20 minutes, an hour, two hours, but well, what have I been doing? And some people... Um, have actually been taken when I've been taken and experienced what I've experienced. And for them, it's, it's, it's awful because they've never had that happen before. And if they're adults um, and they're so fixed in a 3D world to experience something that, that they have taught doesn't exist, for many people, that's a shocking experience. Um, so it, it, it depends. Uh, most of the times I get visited are during the day, not at night. Uh, and that, I think, for most researchers is, is quite, quite surprising. And is this continuing to go on, your visits, or is this a period of your life that it no longer uh, happens? No, it's continuing. What they've said to me is, and I give a quote, it's, you will never be alone. Um, uh, I think that I, was I think from... I probably uh, getting visited roughly about once every six weeks now, so it's really calmed down. At the peak of it, it would have been two times a week. And they come to your home, uh, like, whenever you're alone, in the middle uh, no, of the day? No, don't, they don't wait for me to be alone. Uh, they'll, they'll arrive, and if people are in the same room, they'll just turn up. They, they, if they have a schedule, it's a bit like project management. Um, <laughs> so, you you, you can't just put off. Uh, if you're planning to be with somebody, they plan precisely. And if there are people in the room, they don't just say, oh, well, there's, there's people there, we won't do it. Um, so they'll, they'll just come into to the room and... Uh, one time I was physically taken while driving a motor car and my passenger was also taken as well um, and she uh, experienced it and it, poor woman, you know, she was terribly sweating, um, absolutely shocked. Uh, but for me, it's fairly normal. But that was the first time I'd ever been taken from a motor car and that, that's, that was really quite something. So who was driving? I was driving, yeah. And then you just weren't there anymore or...? Um, you weren't in the car? Well, like, what happened to the car? It floated, uh, yeah, that, you know, you know, floated out of the vehicle, literally floated out and upwards. Huh. And I have no idea how that car was controlled, um, but it was. And then the next thing, after we'd had the experience, um, put back in the motor car. Oh. And I can remember the, uh, a lorry. That's a, a truck for everybody listening in North America. Lorry is a truck. Go ahead. So you uh, saw a truck, a lorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, I do, I do try to, to duel my words, but, you know. So, okay, a lorry truck uh, flashing its headlights at me. And, and I remember thinking, well, oh, what's that about? You know, um, oh, it may, maybe he thinks I've got my, my headlights on full power, you know, and flashed him back to sure. show that I didn't. 
And the passenger next to me said, what's just happened? What's just happened? Ooh. And we were pulling into where we were staying. And she said, we can't be back. It takes it takes half an hour to get here. And we've only been on the road 10 minutes. So we both pulled up and then we both remembered what had happened. And she ran into the house, absolutely terrified. Um, but this is what happens. Uh, they won't just wait for me to be alone. Uh, and there are many, many people who have experienced these creatures when I've been in the room. Okay. Well, I, I think it was a uh, Project Avalon. I heard you discussing something which I found fascinating because uh, of the movie that I'm about to mention. And, and by the way, just before I get into movies, when we were talking about portals earlier, have you seen Monsters Incorporated? That's the new one, isn't it? No, I haven't. No, I well, there, there, there are two of them. And the, there was one that came out fairly recently to much acclaim. I guess I haven't seen it, but the original I saw the first one. Yeah, yeah the original yeah. one. So th that was all portals. I mean, they were literally, yeah. you know, that whole movie was, you know, will scare people and their fear will power everything. Yes. And then, then you know, they showed how they were able to go from interdimensionally back and forth. And I just thought there's a lot of heavy information in this film, even though it's supposed to be some, you know, kids romp cartoon thing it was really there's a lot of stuff going on there uh that you speak of and I, I guess i wonder sometimes how much of that those kinds of ideas make their way into a a fun frolicking family film like that you know when really they're talking about interdimensionality and uh and uh portals and, and those types of things well gene roddenberry the creator of the original star trek um he had a ufo experience when he was on a domestic flight and then he actually hooked up with contactees and some of the descriptions of the aliens that he then created for the, the Star Trek films, he got directly from um, people like myself who would have seen these creatures. If you take someone like uh, Cameron, who, who did the Terminator director oh, James Terminator Cameron, films right. mm -hmm. and Avatar, these people actually meet with mainly the CIA, not the National Security Agency. It's usually CIA guys. And the CIA guys say, hey, I've got a good one for you. Um, here's a good idea. Or we'd like you to push this idea out, please. Um, so Hollywood and the secret intelligence services work very closely together. Yeah, I've heard that uh, if they don't like your script for whatever reason, the narrative or what have you, they won't let you use the aircraft carrier and the, all that heavy equipment. Um, you're right. Um, Stanley Kubrick, uh, who, who made in 1963... Um, how I learned to love the bomb. He actually wrote to um, uh, the, the NSA and the SAC, Strategic Air Command, asking to film on a bomber, and they refused. And they insisted that before the film went public, they had the first viewing of it. And uh, they were so impressed with him that um, they offered him a job. So you're absolutely right that they, they will vet scripts to ensure that uh, nothing is going out that would compromise their future security. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that. At the, I was speaking with someone a couple of weeks ago on the show, and we were talking about how at the trailer, at the end of the uh, at the credits, at the end of the film, if you see uh, special thanks to the U.S. military, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, well, you know you've been force-fed some kind of um, propaganda, even if it's a love story. So yeah. So now, Simon, why have you come to the place now? And you're, you said you're fifty something years old, and you've been doing this, you know, for fifty years. You've been, you know, connected with these interdimensional people who collect you, and that's a long time. And sometimes people have one uh, fascinating experience like that in their lives, and this is happening for you on a regular basis. Have you discovered what it is in you or about you that has you singled out for this collection and contact with these? other worldly beings yeah well all, all people who um are of interest to uh alien creatures generally through uh, a bloodline which is something that you know humans would understand but it's not just about bloodlines it's about the soul in in the western world we've really forgotten the fact that inside your physical body is your energetic true self in the east um, the Eastern religions, they fully understand the difference between the physical body and the energetic soul. Um, and uh, it's very clear that when your physical body dies, your soul is, for want of a better word, recycled and put into another body. So they can follow that and, and you will reincarnate however many times and they will follow that just as a scientist 
will tranquilize a, uh, a bear or a fox. And uh, when that animal has cubs, it will then, the scientists will then put tags on them and it will chase, trace those families through 20, 30 years. Well, some of these aliens can live up to a thousand years. So if you know one human lifetime of 70, 80, 90 years is nothing to them. So they will follow many generations of humans, go right back to Sumerian times and come through from Sumeria times and Mesopotamia to the Egyptian times. Um, uh, you know, those aliens are still alive now um, through cloning processes that were around at the time of the pharaohs. The ones so, that are a thousand years old that are still alive now? Have well, been yes, because cloned. they can clone their bodies if they choose to. So they can um, perpetually clone. So there might be someone out there who's, who's seven, eight thousand years old who's, who's cloned himself seven or eight times. Yeah, there, there is a limit to the cloning. Ah, um, okay. Over, after a, a long period of cloning, <laughs> some of the genetic material is incorre incorrectly coded. Yeah, like putting uh, something in a photocopier over and over again. Absolutely. You, yeah. You, yeah, Alan, I think that's a really good way of saying it. Yeah, I think I met some people like that uh, who have that makeup. <laughs> Uh, I, I see them all the time. <laughs> what, uh, Simon, we, we've got another segment with you and we have some more time in this one, but I really want to ask you uh, about some uh, uh, business that went on in Europe and clarify it for us. There was a, a large situation, and when I say that, I mean the media made a big deal out of it, and every time that happens, I suspect that they're, uh, it's a smoke and mirror show. And I'm referring to the CERN Hadron Collider. I know you've spoken much about this. I just kind of would love you to encapsulate what that was or is or what they were doing there officially and what really happened there and why they're doing that. Um, the Hadron Collider uh, officially was looking for dark matter or the Bose Higgson particle. It was um, sold as a device that could help us to understand where the Big Bang came from. Uh, the first thing that anybody who researches this would um, really begin to question is that we live in a world of money. Businessmen and businesswomen do not invest in something unless there's a big financial return. That is the way the corporate world is. Now, this device has no, no companies owning it. Uh, countries have paid for it. In other words, what's happened is America has gone round to all its friends and ordered them to raid their black budgets to pay for this device. It's on the border between France and Switzerland. Um, it is a two-fold device. It's a weapon, but it's also used to experiment with the possibility of bending time. Uh, on the 21st of December 2012, contrary to a lot of people. Uh, there was a change, an energetic change, uh, which lifted humanity out of the, the, the... I was going to use the word um, gutter, but it lifted, in, lifted humanity out of the sidewalk. Uh, and the CERN device was placed there uh, to operate, to try to prevent humanity altering. Um, for the better, or, or for more advantageous for humans. Well, mean. to raise the frequency... The Earth was going to be in the center of the galaxy. It was going to be bathed by um, very strong energetic waves for a period of three days. And interestingly enough, the CERN device was scheduled to operate exactly over this period. Now, the CERN device has got many, many scientists there, and who on Earth would want to be working over the Christmas period? But that's what it was scheduled to do. Um, and it was very important that this device did not operate, because it, if it had operated, it could have adversely affected um, the future timeline that humans are currently on. Let me just stop you there. Like, what is it doing when it's operating? Just going around with incredibly powerful centrifugal force, the likes of which we've never seen? Or what, what kind of energy or power or, or benefit are they getting from this thing? Like, what, it's a circular installation, as I understand. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a circular collider. Um, they're not getting any benefit out of it at all. The, obje the object of it was to... Uh, 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 trying to put it in a way that makes some sort of sense. To, to jam is a, probably the best way to put it, to jam the frequency that was bathing the Earth over that critical period, to send out a frequency wave that would uh, jam or change the timeline the Earth was on. Uh, and it failed. It actually broke down and was broken down over the critical three-day period. Uh, interestingly enough, while I was on Avalon, this is 
while ago. This is Bill Ryan's site, ex Camelot, Project Camelot fame. Sure. Got a lot of time for Bill, actually. He's, he's a great guy. And um, it was brought to my attention that uh, another chap in South America was also warning about the Collider, and he'd been going around South America to all the hidden uh, temples and pyramids that are hidden in the jungle in South America, placing religious uh, devices which he hoped would um, save humanity. Uh, and he didn't know it, and I didn't know it, but we were both working together, and he was the backstop. So if the Collider had operated, then his fallback position would have been required. As it happened, he wasn't required because the device failed to operate. I'll ask you if the device uh, lies fallow. Did they have any future plans for it or what have you uh, as soon as we come back? All right, we were discussing with Simon Parks the Hadron Collider, and I was uh, asking Simon, is it working? What's happening with it? Is it just sitting there? What are the plans? I mean, that was 2012. Or we're into 2014 now. What goes on over there? Um, they Once it failed... Uh, their opportunity to um, bring about change that they want. Uh, they're very, very pushed for time. They must do it by 2015 stroke 2016. So they need a, a more powerful collider um, because the one that they have now is not powerful enough. So they've um, been able to force the Japanese to build one on the ja on on one of the islands just off the mainland of Japan. So the Build Japanese another island, Hadron Collider uh, off the coast? Yes, of, uh, and, and yes, you're going to balance that on the volcanic ridge that is the yes, mountain range absolutely. that they've already teeter-tottered a disaster. It may be a linear <laughs> collider. Mm. The big argument at the moment is that the Americans want the Japanese to pay for all of it, um, which would probably be around about the $4 billion mark. And the Japanese are, are trying to get out of paying for all of it. So that's where we stand. And the they're a little busy right now as well. Pardon? The Japanese are a little busy right now with the other disaster that they're trying to fix. Well, you know. it, 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 these, are, these are linked. I mean, um, I don't know how you can pay to fix whatever happened in Fukushima. It's inconceivable to me, but you've got to do something. And at the same time, you've got to build a brand new Hadron Collider and perch it on the edge of a volcanic ridge. And I mean, well, who, who's going to think that's a good idea? You know? Well, the, Amer the Americans think it's an extremely good idea. Really? Um, That's crazy to me. No, because if the Japanese, if the Japanese build and pay four billion dollars for a device that the Americans will use, why would the Japanese get another disaster? Oh, okay. So the implication being that, that, that America meets out those disasters, and if you want to play ball with us, then you're no more earthquakes for you. You've got it. In wow. One. Well, that is really dark. I mean, I hope that that I hope you're wrong because here's what I think. I mean, there's so much trouble right now with the the pipeline that's going across the oil pipelines and installing them. You know, there's people for them and against them on both sides of the. It's just a constant nightmare, and the people that are against it are concerned about the environment. Now, I'm sure that if the news breaks into the mainstream, that uh, they're going to enlarge the hadron collider and fold it into the topography of Japan while they're still digging out of this uh, nuclear nightmare, I think a lot of people are going to say, no way, forget it. I mean, I, that's how I don't think it's a good idea, even if the Americans do. Well, I, I agree with you that it's not a good idea, and I can assure you that it will never work. Yeah, I mean, the one embedded in rock didn't work. I don't see how this one's going to work. Correct. Well, it sure is a, an amazing thing to be able to convince the populace that you need to spend, uh, what was it, $52 billion or whatever it was to to put this thing on. I mean, I, you know, they're doing that right now with the Olympics, but there's more of an immediate visceral payoff for people even that don't follow sports very much. But to, to stick a circular thing in the ground that doesn't do anything and, and sign on for $52 billion, I mean, do you ever use your political... A position to try to convince people? I mean, that sounds crazy because the President of the United States tries to convince people and nobody believes him, but do you ever try to, you know, have a town hall meeting and say, look, folks, this is what's going on? Let's talk about how, how we, we, we do alter things. Um, in September of last year, uh, the National Security Agency opened their new uh, super security center in America, which was designed to hold uh, supercomputers that would 
uh, hold every email, every telephone conversation, every piece of Twitter, any piece of information and store it forever. And uh, this operation is codenamed uh, Bumble Hive. So it's Bumble Hive. That is the code name for this operation. And in September, they had a ribbon cutting ceremony. Uh, they had some very, very high power generals come down. The media were there. They cut the ribbon, and um, the place is actually in Bluffdale in, in America. And um, at the moment that they turned up to cut the ribbon, all the power went off for the whole center, and they were out for about seven hours. That is the sort of message that gets right to the very top. That is the way that things are influenced, not sitting in a town hall talking. Okay. Simon, what's your take on the entire Edward Snowden revealing top secrets affair? Um, what you have to, to, to be clear on is that the aliens advising the American government are not the same aliens that are advising the Russian government. Um, and because of that, uh, the, the, the Russians are distancing themselves very, very, very dramatically from the Americans. And that is why the Americans are spying uh, on the Russians as much as they can. Ed Snowden um, got it about right. Um, uh, he decided that he, he felt uncomfortable holding in the knowledge and that humanity needed to know that the Americans were on a game changer in terms of being able to listen in to everything that anybody was saying. Uh, and he wanted to alert people what was going on. Uh, he gambled that the, the Russians would support him because he had knowledge of, of the, the, the aliens that were supporting the Americans. And by and large, the, the Russians did actually um, help him out. Hmm. So, okay, I just there are conflicting points of view on his legitimacy. But, uh, ah, well, he, he, they, they tried to do a mind job on him. Um, what they'll, all, they'll always do is if they can't discredit somebody publicly, they attempt to get an agent uh, into close proximity with that person. Not to kill them because that would backfire because that person is very, very high profile. But what they'll attempt to do is to affect their mind in some way. Um, they, they, they did it with a number of people, and uh, they, they had some success with him. Hmm. Well, I hope, uh, I hope he lives. I don't know what the full story is with him, but I hope they don't get to him. I find it hard to believe that they can't, though, you know? That's what I have a tough time swallowing. I think if you have done what he claims to have done and what they purport that he has done, I find it very difficult to believe that the United States somehow... Uh, didn't know he was getting away and using his passport and flying to Hong Kong and, you know, I mean, he's an NSA guy. They, didn't, they weren't even watching the store, basically, with their own employee. And I just found it a little strange that it was so easy for him to get away and that we all know that if, if, if we really want someone out of the picture, uh, we can do that. We can do it uh, violently or we can do it by uh, character assassination. But it's yeah, never a problem uh, to send, a, you know, no. uh, some kind of a hit team anywhere to get something done. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, you see, that when, when you are a, a spy, uh, that's he's like Mossad, uh, who are probably the best in the world at uh, liquidating people, um, then that is what you do. But when somebody has got thousands and thousands of gigabytes of information which they've stored in a very safe location and it makes no matter whether you're killed or not somebody else will publish that information um, what you want to do as a security agency is to find out exactly what information you've got and try and do a deal and so during that period where he was held up in an airport and all the rest of it what they, the NSA were trying to do was to say we'll do like a plea bargain um, you give us this information um, and we'll go easy on you. So that was the battle. But because the Russian security service was involved and was taking Snowden's side, it wasn't a simple straight case of the system against an individual. It was the system against an individual backed up by another system. And that's what complicated it for the Americans. Mm. That is complicated. Well, we just have a few uh, minutes left, and I would like, okay. like to ask you... Um, 
uh, you're, you're, you've hypothesized that, uh, and we've all realized that there are seemingly an increasing amount of oil spills uh, around the world. I mean, it's happening all over the place. We're having train derailments in Canada dropping like the temperature at the polar vortex. It's unbelievable. So uh, I don't know what's happening there, but it's more than I ever remember it. And you say that the one reason, at least, for the increasing amount of oil spills around the world is the deliberate killing off of the dolphins. Now, why is that? How do you know that? And, and if that's true, who is it benefiting to kill off a dolphin? In, in America, it is illegal to touch or swim with a dolphin unless it's in a, uh, an aquatic uh, federal or state approved uh, center. Uh, it's the only rule they have like that. And, and you'd have to ask the question, why doesn't the American government, through the federal states, why don't they want you being with a dolphin? Okay, I'll ask that question. Why don't they? Okay, because they know that dolphins are not what the uh, biological history tells us. Um, many, 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 many millions of years ago, when a form of aliens, a race of aliens, came to this planet, there was only one evolved life form that was capable of sustaining their souls, and that of the dolphins. Of sustaining um, their souls? Yes. So I, I, we spoke earlier where I talked about the difference between the body, the physical body, and the, um, the essence or the soul of the person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, when, when you live in this world and, you know, you, hey, we've got bills to pay and we've got uh, cars to run, we don't really tend to think about spiritual stuff very much. So we're very physical. If we can't see it and we can't touch it, we don't really believe in it, unless it's God. Can't see God, can't touch God, but hey, that's religion, so that's okay. We can believe in that. And that's odd anyway. But the fact of the matter is that most people don't see beyond the physical body of a person. So if somebody's called John, they'll just know John as the body. They don't actually appreciate that inside every living human being there is the essence and when that person dies I don't know if you've ever seen a dead person mm -hmm. but their face changes dramatically and in the Bible it says that the, 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 the Holy Ghost leaves the body right so the Bible is actually trying to tell people that every human has a spirit now that is actually more important than the body so aliens have the technology to place that spirit inside certain living creatures and the dolphins are one of them uh, and one of the best ways to kill off dolphins is to make it look like an accident so if you look where their breeding grounds are if you look where they that they follow the fish from I was one say, part just of the ocean to the other you can drop your oil just push them down and, the stairs and you can try and kill them and that's exactly what they've done over the last 25 to 30 years are we uh, uh, do we have an endangered no no we don't um, they're not on the endangered list uh, often when, when, and it's always America, uh, by and large, when America <laughs> does something, it is generally as a warning shot. Um, it's generally to make a statement that the general public don't understand. It's, it's to a higher level. It's if you don't lay off, we are going to do this or we're going to do that. Just like um, the terrible disaster at the nuclear plant at Japan was a statement to the Japanese government. If you don't do what we want, this is what will happen to you. And, you know, it's, it's what America has done. And Great Britain did it beforehand in its own way. You know, when, when, when Britain sort of owned half the world, we have a saying in Britain, which was, if you don't do what we want, we'll send a gunboat. And Simon, we only have a minute left. Are we going to get out of the woods on this uh, Fukushima yes, we, disaster? Yes, we, uh, yeah, the, the Fukushima one, the, the, the danger for us is, is the radiation that's entered the water. Um, if you can get hold of, I've seen them, satellite pictures, you'll find a huge amount of radiation. In fact, on, on the coast of America now, facing it, um, a lot of the fish are arriving dead. Lots of people now on that coast of America are not eating uh, the fish. It has a, having a big impact. But you say but it's going to turn around for us somehow. Um, radiation isn't, unless it's a huge quantity of radiation, it's not as bad as people make out. In fact, radiation is necessary for evolution of humans to a certain extent. Um, we haven't got time to go into that. But we certainly it, don't. Simon, will you come back sometime? <laughs> We've hit the yeah, wall listen, here. I'm, I'm delighted to come back. It is such a big subject oh, that one huge. hour just isn't enough. It isn't.
But uh, I, I want to have you back soon. We're going to figure this out shortly. I'd be delighted. It's thank you so to speak much. To you, and it's lovely to speak to all your listeners. Oh, well, thank you for coming on, Simon. It was great listening to you. You take care. Bye bye now. Thanks for listening to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Please offer comments or complaints by emailing conspiracyqueries at gmail.com or on Twitter at con underscore queries or at our website, conspiracyqueries.com. Thanks for listening. Okay, that's great, Simon. I really, okay. that was amazing. Would, uh, I, I, you know, an hour is so short. That's all I have. But uh, uh-huh. I, I want to, um, I'm, I'm trying to build like an adjunct uh, to the show so that if you're listening to it on the podcast, you can get that second half hour or second hour or what have you on sure. top of that. But we'll sure. we'll work that out later. But that was very uh, wonderful, and I, I'm sure we could talk more. I mean, I want to ask you about the Mantis and, and these different... I know, we didn't really get a chance we to didn't talk get into about it. the alien side much, did we? But I know what you mean. Well, like, if somebody from Mars came to Earth and they dropped them in, uh, say, I don't know, uh, Greenland... And then they spent a week there, and then when they went back to Mars, they'd say, so what are the people on Earth like? And they would say, oh, well, they've all got these big coats, and they, they wear, uh, you know, and they would explain Iceland. And they go, oh, okay, cool. But they don't realize there's Africa, South America, everything else. That's what you're saying. The people make a misconception with aliens. It's just like, boom, one thing, that's it. But you're talking yes. about a whole bunch of different races yes. and timelines, and they're all interconnected, or, or at least aware of each other. No, they're very aware. The best, the best way I can describe it, Alan, is, um, and, I, and I try and give it as an example when I do my talks, is to say if you think on Earth, if you have a project, um, you go around to all the different companies that can supply you the equipment to accomplish that project. So you might go to Germany, you might go to France, you might go to Britain, and you'll get all the specialists to help you to deliver that project. Well, they're exactly the same. They'll go and go for those races that can deliver certain technologies to allow them to do it. So they actually sign up themselves to undertake different projects. And some of those projects are negative to humanity. Some don't have uh, negative or positive, And others are good. Um, so it, it's really about which race a person is being contacted by because that will dictate, A, how they are being dealt with and, B, what their agenda is. And, and one other thing I didn't get to ask you that I wanted to is, I mean, a lot of people want to be the, the center of attention. I mean, I'm a stand-up comic, so I know what that's all about. But okay. h- how, do you, how do you take someone who wants to have something happen to them? I know there are people that just, every fiber they're being, they would just love to be taken up into a flying saucer and whisked around. The, you know what I mean? Like people, they just want that excitement and they have a void in their own personal uh, spirituality or, or comfort zone with their own body and they just want something exciting to happen but yet those interdimensional beings are selecting people like you and you know somebody else in different places and I'm sure they're aware that people want to be contacted but like what is it about that's the thing I didn't quite get a, a cap on what is it about you that they're going to come back to you all the time I mean, you seem like a very level-headed, rational person and, and completely the opposite of the stereotypical hmm. UFO contactee nut bar kind of representation. Well, again, the problem is that um, if we're judging something that's not human with human values, then we can't possibly arrive at a, a logical explanation. Uh, many people do come to me and say exactly what you've said. I want to be contacted by aliens. And I say to them, no, you don't. You're not prepared for it. You're not ready for it. Uh, I was contacted from a very early age, so I got used to it. You know what? If you were a child of three months old and you were put on an aeroplane and you flew from Montreal to Vancouver, and every week you, you did that, by the time you were age of five, you could fly to JFK and you'd be fine because you knew no different. But if someone's in their 30s, 40s or 50s and they have an alien experience, it will completely freak them out because they have no structure from which to hang it by. And yes, they say, I've seen videos and I've read books and I'm ready for it. No, they're not. It will completely and utterly change their life for the worse. I think if you're calling it into yourself, you're definitely not ready for it. It's, it's yeah, a shallow the, the, game. These, these creatures select because 
the people they select are important to them. And I've made it, you know, really clear. That I'm, there's nothing special about me. I'm just an ordinary person, but obviously I'm important to them. But within the human structure, I'm just an ordinary person going about his life, um, you know, and that's just the way it is. Well, thank you very much for sharing your time with us. And, it's a pleasure. Uh, I'll, I'll send you an email down the way, and uh, we'll have you on see how things are going maybe in the summer or something. Yeah, you take care. All right. Thank you, Simon. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.